Hi, my name is Professor Don Patterson, and this is a lecture that's part four of about a five-part series on XML. And today, in this particular lecture, what we're going to talk about is how to create well-formed XML and why we're doing that anyway. Some key points I'd like you to take away from this lecture are that XML has a simple syntax for representing tree-like data using tags. It's based on the idea of nested elements or tags. In the XML syntax, capitalization matters, and you have to be careful because some characters are handled specially. Let's dig into this a little bit. This series on XML is breaking down the different components of XML, starting with files and character encoding at the bottom, moving up on up to schemas at the top. And in this lecture, we're going to be talking about the tag structure. XML has flexible tags. Here's an example of XML. The first line is a declaration informing any, any computer processor that's reading it that what comes next is XML and what version it is, etc. And then you see tags. Tags are, for example, the word note with the angle brackets around it. And that tag is paired at the bottom with another tag that has note in it, but also has a forward slash at the beginning. Those are called opening and closing tags. The editor that I screen captured this bit of XML from color coded some of these words to indicate the different roles that they have in the document. The color doesn't mean anything. It's just helpful from the editor. Help, it's help provided from the editor. All the things that are colored brown are tags. And those words are nothing special. Well-formed XML can use any tags that the author would like to use. Because of this, we say that XML has a flexible tag and a flexible structure. In fact, the X in XML stands for extensible, and it is that. You can extend this language with any tags you'd like. So in XML, the author gets to choose the tags that they want, words like note or to or from. There aren't any predefined tags in XML, or at least in well-defined XML, so from and to they're not defined anywhere. No one's telling the author of this document to use those. They've just decided that they want to use them. Not defined by an XML standard. But there's probably a reason why the author is using those. Possibly because it communicates something about the data that's stored in this file. But more likely it's because there's some other consumer of this file, either another human or software, that's expecting tags and expecting them to be in a particular structure. And so because of that, the author of this is writing a document that someone else is going to be able to read. In addition to being able to choose the tags themselves, in XML, the author is also able to choose the structure. So for example, the way in which two from heading and body appear next to each other, and the way they're sort of inside the notes tag. That's a decision about structure that the author is allowed to make. Now the author, unlike tags, the author can't choose anything for the structure of XML. There are some particular simple constraints that are required for XML to be considered well-formed. Let's contrast this to HTML. HTML also has a very similar tag structure and also has a, has, XML also has very familiar tag syntax. It also has a similar flexible structure, but in contrast to XML, HTML has predefined tags, things like the P tag, the H1 tag, the A or anchor tag with the href attribute. These are all tags that are common in an HTML document, and they are in fact defined. They're defined by a web standards body because an HTML document is going to, and it's expected to be read by a web browser. And that web browser has to know what's going to be in the document so that it can render it correctly for the user uh, who wants to look at a web page. So the web browser expects certain tags, and so HTML is a version, uh, is a kind of document that has predefined tags. It, in fact, HTML almost uses the exact same structure of X, of X, as XML. Specific tags, but very similar structure. So on the right is a screenshot of a little bit of XML, and on the left is a screenshot of some HTML. And you can see, although the color coding is different, in fact, the tags on the right are brown and the tags on the left are red, for example, the structure is very similar. 
There are opening tags and closing tags. Closing tags have a forward slash before the tag name itself, and they're embedded within one another. The words are different, the particular tags are different, but there seems to be something similar between, between the two. H, H, HTML and XML do have a lot of similarities. But XML does not replace HTML, nor does HTML replace XML. They complement each other. They're used to do different ta tasks. Now there is a special language called XHTML. XHTML refers to those documents that are both XML and HTML. By that I mean that the document follows all the rules of, a of XML syntax, but also only uses the tags that are compliant with HTML. It only uses the HTML tags that have been defined by the standards body, the W3C. So XHTML is a smaller category. It's the category that XML and HTML overlap. Well, how does XML function? Well, here are some things that it's good for. XML separates data from presentation. So in this screenshot down here, you can see that there's some sense of this being a message of some kind, an instant message, a note, something like that. But the way in which this information would be presented is not really present in the document. You could imagine all kinds of different presentations for this particular XML, including presentations that aren't visual. For example, having a voice assistant read it off to you. Another way that XML functions, and another reason why it is helpful, is because it simplifies data sharing. If a document is well-formed XML, other programs can read that and are going to be able to process and parse it correctly. XML also simplifies data transport. Because it's simply a text file, it's easy enough to transfer over the network so that one operating system can communicate with another operating system by using the XML standard. If those are different operating systems, then XML is also simplifying platform changes as you move from Windows to Mac to Linux to something else. And because of that, publishing data in XML makes it more usable than if you were to publish it in an unstructured way. If you were to take this note and just put it in some arbitrary other format, it would be difficult for a program to read. The program would have to know very specifically the format that you're using. But any program that can read XML is going to be able to at least parse this even if it doesn't know what to do with the data. Because of this, XML is the basis of several languages. So, for example, XHTML. XHTML is a subset of XML. It is a version of XML that is good for rendering web pages. WSDL is another subset of XML. It's different, and what it does is it describes APIs for web services. RSS is the name of another language that is a subset of XML. It is XML with some specific tags. And this is used to describe news feeds. RDF and OWL, they're special languages that are also a subset of XML. And they're used to describe relationships and categories or ontologies. Finally, XAML, X-A-M-L, is a subset of XML. It's well-formed XML with specific tags that's used to describe Microsoft user interfaces. So XML is the basis of lots of different languages. So knowing how to form well-formed XML has potential benefits in a lot, of different, um, a lot of different domains. Well, the structure of XML, we've talked a little bit about the tags. The structure of HTML lends itself to a tree structure, a tree structure in the way that computer scientists talk about it. To support this, we need to recognize some constraints that XML puts on us. Each XML document has to have one root tag. It can optionally have child tags, but typically almost all XML documents are going to have child tags because they're representing some complex data. Those tags will wrap, they'll come around, they'll be before and after both children tags and data, or just raw text like we saw in the note. An opening tag looks like this one. The word tag itself could be a tag. What makes it an opening tag is the fact that it has the brackets on either side. What makes a closing tag a closing tag is that it uses a tag name that has come before, but it's preceded by a forward slash. 
Now valid XX, valid XML is going to have one root tag, and in addition to that, it's going to have one closing tag for every opening tag. So it's going to have a pair. Every time you open a tag, you've got to close the tag as well. So how does this support forming a tree structure? Well, here is a graphic that shows a tree structure in the way that computer scientists understand it. You can see that there's a node at the top and arrows going down, cookbook going to salad, soups, and desserts, salads going to garden salad and noodle salad, and all of the things on the second to bottom row point to ingredients and directions. This is a kind of structure for a cookbook. It's hierarchical, it has a tree structure, how do we realize this structure, this abstract structure, using the syntax of XML? Let's look at how we might do that. So let's start by taking the root tag, in this case cookbook. You can see that this document, this structure has one root tag. That's one of our requirements of XML. And over on the left, in the XML screenshot, you can see that it starts with a cookbook tag. Something I haven't introduced yet is an attribute. In this case, author is an attribute. It's assigned the value Don Patterson using the strings and quotes. Then embedded within the cookbook tag, and what do I mean by embedded within it? I mean the salads tag is embedded within the cookbook tag. The salads tag is a child of the cookbook tag. And that's because the salad tag is open before the cookbook tag closes. And because of that, the salad is contained within the cookbook tag and therefore it is a child of the cookbook tag. Well, salads has its own children. Salads has two children, garden salad and noodle salad. And you can see that because garden salad is closed before noodle salad is open, garden salad and noodle sal salad function like siblings if this were a family tree. Garden salad has an attribute called category that's assigned the value of vegan. And then garden salad has two children as well. The children are an ingredients node and a directions node. And these two nodes are siblings, siblings and children of the garden salad. Ingredients has some data and the data is lettuce and tomatoes. The directions has data as well. Chop them and put them in a bowl. All right, so we can see that at least under salads, we have a structure that reflects this tree diagram um, behind me. Let's look at the second chunk of this cookbook, the soups chunk. You can see that soups is a sibling to salads because soup starts after salad ends. Soups contains two children, chicken soup and gazpacho. These are reflected in the abstract diagram behind me, but they're also reflected in the text as well. Both chicken soup and gazpacho each have their own, ch each have two children, and both of those nodes, the two children are ingredients and directions. And the gazpacho uh, ingredients data is it tomatoes, cucumbers, and garlic. And then the directions for the gazpacho is to blend it all. Don't actually make any food based on this recipe, these recipes. Finally, the last chunk of the tree is desserts. You can see that desserts is a sibling to soups. There are three siblings under cookbook, salads, soups, and desserts. Desserts has chocolate chip cookies and baklava as two children. They are siblings. Baklava is not a child of chocolate chip cookies, because baklava's opening tag doesn't open until chocolate chip cookies is closed. And so they're siblings, not children. Finally, they both have ingredients and directions. Down at the bottom, you can see the very last line in this XML document is cookbook. And that means that all of the content in this file are children of the cookbook node. And cookbook is the one root node, the top level of all of these different nodes. And in that way, XML is able to create a tree or hierarchical structure. And there are a lot of times when you're manipulating data when you want a hierarchical structure. Think about maybe uh, the file hierarchy in, um, on your hard drive. That's arranged like a um, tree structure. And so you could represent that um, in principle with XML. A few details about the choice of these tags. We've said that they have to be opened and closed in pairs. That's true about XML. It's not actually true about HTML, and this is one of the ways in which they differ. So for example, in HTML, you can get away with opening a paragraph with a P tag and not closing it. Just having P, this is a paragraph. And then P, this is another paragraph. Those two lines aren't valid HTML. 
to make they are valid HTML. They're not valid XML. To make them valid XML, you would have to put a closing tag on both of them. This is a paragraph. This is another paragraph. It happens to be that these final two lines are both well-formed XML, and because they're using understood HTML tags, this makes these two this two these two lines also XHTML. Actually, it's all three. It's XML, XHTML, and HTML. Here's another tag detail. It's possible to use a shortcut closing syntax if your tag doesn't have any data and if your tag doesn't have any children. So let's look at some of these here. Let's look at this first line. Something opening tag and something closing tag with text in the middle. Well, this is good XML. The tags are um, matched properly and the and they're fine. It's a good good XML. But it's bad HTML because the something tag is not defined in the HTML standard. The second case, this is also good H XML. There's a nothing opening tag and a nothing closing tag. There doesn't happen to be anything in between, but that's okay. There doesn't have to be anything in between. The tag is nothing. There's no children and no data in that tag. It's not good HTML, though, because nothing is not a defined tag in the HTML standard. The third line is the shortcut closing. This shortcut closing is equivalent to the previous line. So if you say nothing and end it with a forward slash, that's the same as doing the line above it. Nothing tag and then nothing opening tag and then nothing closing tag. Just like the line above it, this is good, good XML. It's considered an opening and closing tag. But it's bad HTML because nothing is not a known tag in the HTML standard. The bottom three lines are a little bit different. So the first one is the opposite. This is an IMG or image tag. It has an attribute SRC or source, which tells you where to get the image from. This is bad XML because it doesn't have a closing image tag. It happens to be good HTML though. This would be fine in a browser. Here's an example of something that's both XML and HTML, both good. It's the same image tag, but we added a closing image tag. That makes this well-formed XML. It also makes it, it's, it is also well-formed HTML. Finally, in the last example, we're using the shortcut tag again. Instead of having an opening tag and a closing tag and not putting any data in the middle, we can just close that tag in one angle bracket by putting the forward slash at the end of the um, metadata there between the angle brackets. Both these bottom two lines are both good XML and good HTML because those tags are known. And because they're both good XML and both good HTML, that makes them good XHTML. You may not have thought about it, but capitalization matters. So XML tags are case sensitive. So this first line here, this line is incorrect. It's not valid XML, it's not valid HTML. And that's because message in the opening tag has a capital M. And that's considered different than the closing tag, which has a lowercase m in the message. They have to match capitalization. And so the bottom two are fine. The second line has lowercase message, and the third has capital mess M message. Both of them are fine. They just have to be consistent between their opening and closing tag. The other thing that's critical to make well-formed XML structure is to make sure that, the nest, that nesting is properly done. This is what enforces the tree structure. XML tags must be properly nested. This is, again, a difference with HTML. For example, HTML allows this structure, a B tag and then an I tag. That indicates the start of bold and the start of italic. And then closing the B tag and closing the I tag. The reason why this is um, not valid XML is because the B tag was closed before the I tag was closed. In XML, you have to close a tag before you can close a parent tag. You have to close a child tag before you can close a parent tag. So while the first line is valid HTML, good XML requires the bottom tag, swapping the way in which you're closing the italics and closing the bold. This structure in the bottom example gives us, or, or this uh, text in the bottom line, gives us a structure that looks like this. A B as a parent, an I as a child, 
and then the data, bold and italic, as a child of the I node. And I just gave that a slightly different format in the tree structure to indicate that it's a data node, not a tag. Properly nested XML is required in order to be able to parse and understand a tree structure. We have one root tag. We've mentioned that. So just to reiterate, XML documents have to have one root tag. That's the top level tag. In this little chunk of XML over on the left, I've called it root. And that root tag has one child, and that child has two subchild children. It creates an abstract structure like this um, diagram uh, here on my right. Let's break down a little bit these attributes. Tags can have attributes as well. This is additional data that's within the tag to help modify or clarify or expand on the um, interpretation of the tag. These attributes follow with follow the tag name. They have to um, be one continuous word, so they can't have spaces in them. They have to be set equal to something. And what they are set equal to has to be a quoted string. So this first example is bad because although the attribute date is all right, what it's set equal to is not within double quotes. It's not a string. If we want to make this correct, we can do what's on the right. We could keep everything the same, but put quotes around the attribute value. And that's going to make this attribute parsable by a well-formed XML parser. There are some characters that have to be treated specially in the data of XML. And that's because if you imagine that you were a computer trying to read an XML document and you were to encounter some special characters, you might not know whether they are part of the XML structure or part of the data that's wanted to be, that the author wants to communicate. So because XML is just text, we have to treat some characters specially. Here's an example. If you put a less than sign in your data or in the text, it's going to mess up the XML parsing. So for example, let's say you have an opening tag message and a closing tag message, that's well formed. But the data that you want to put in between them is something like, if salary is less than 1,000, then. This is going to mess up an XML parser because when it encounters the less than after salary, it's going to think that what follows is a tag. But that's not what the author's intent is. The author's intent is to have a less than in the data. So that means, that whenever you have a less than or one of these four other characters in the data of an XML document, you have to use a special character in order to escape them. The five characters that you have to be careful of are ampersands, less thans, greater thans, double quotes, and apostrophes or single quotes. And the way that we handle that is instead of putting the single character in our data, we replace it with an ampersand, some special characters, and a semicolon. So that if salary less than 1,000 then message would properly be written in well-formed XML as the bottom line indicates. If salary ampersand LT semicolon 1,000 then message. XML parsers will understand that this should be translated into a less than whenever it's treated as data. But that ampersand LT semicolon doesn't mess up the understanding of the um, XML tag structure. XML can have comments. And this is a way for an author to suspend the XML rules for a certain block of the text by putting that text in the comments. In this screenshot, the comments are indicated in blue. The way you start a, the way you start a comment is with a less than exclamation mark and two dashes. Anything after this is treated as a comment until you get to the end of the comment, which is indicated with a dash dash greater than. It's kind of like a special purpose tag. It's a little bit reminiscent of the first line of an XML document where we define that this is an XML document with the less than question mark symbol at the beginning. If you think about it for a little bit, you might recognize that attributes and tags are kind of interchangeable in a way. You can provide the structure, the information data, you can provide the information architecture in multiple ways. And because of that, it's kind of interchangeable with respect to representational power. 
So let's example, let's examine two possible ways of representing a person's name and gender. In the first case, we have a parent tag called, in both cases, we have a root tag called person. But in the first case, we provide the gender as an attribute to the person tag. And then we have a child tag first name and a child tag last name, both of which have data, Anna and Smith. But in the second example, instead of making gender an attribute, we decide to make gender a child tag of the person node. And now we have the same tags, first name, last name, and gender, and we treat female as data in a tag structure rather than as an attribute. So these are somewhat interchangeable. Um, sometimes they are, it's, it's just sort of natural depending on what sort of information you're representing to represent them in different ways. Let me show you another example of the way in which an attribute can be interchanged. Here are three possible XML representations, each of them with a root node of message. And what I want to draw your attention to is the date information. In the first example, the date is treated as an attribute, and the string is quoted as it should be, and the date is given there in kind of American style. In the second case, we have removed the date from the attribute, and instead we've placed it in a child node with the tag date. And in the third example, we've actually given it even more structure. We've given the message node a child of date, and then the date node three children, month, day, and year, each of which we have provided a number as data. All three of them are somewhat representationally compar comparable, um, not drastically different, in some ways, the third one is nicer because it doesn't require us to understand which nationality of date formatting we're using because we're making it very specific, very explicit, what the month, the day, and the year are. So to summarize, we're talking about how to make well-formed XML in this lecture. XML has a simple syntax for representing tree-like data with tags. just has some basic rules that you have to be careful of. It's based on the idea of nesting elements or tags. There's got to be one root tag, and you have to make sure that every tag is closed before another one. But you can't have them, they have to be closed, um, they have to be nested inside each other. They can't be crisscrossed like the bold and italic example. Capitalization in the tags matter. Um, tags can have attributes, and some characters are handled specially, five of them. Apostrophe, less than, greater than, double quote, and single quote. Keeping these rules in mind will give you the ability to write well-formed XML by hand or learn how to read well-formed XML or potentially write a program that outputs well-formed XML. Thank you for your attention. I hope that this provides you some ability to parse XML when you see it in data files um, as you're debugging or working with the computer and the web applications um, that you're working on. Thanks for your attention.